you are back at the Rhetoric Warriors podcast where we are breaking down the entire linguistic structure of the universe, tearing it into pieces and showing you how it's all stitched together. These are complicated times, of course, they require sophisticated techniques, so we're going to give you some of that. I am Dr. Dan, friendly neighborhood rhetorician, escaped professor, late night comedy writer, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. I'm here to I don't know, help, you know, just give to the world. That's why I'm here, Mike. I'm here to give. <laughs> you, you, you've never, I've never seen you take. It's always, I'm, a, I'm just a giver. You pour yourself out. You I pour do. yourself out. And every day I refill myself and pour it out again. So With love. Again. With love. So I'm the purpose of the uh, Rhetoric Warriors podcast, I talk to comedians, explore comedy and politics. Sometimes, usually it's just comedy. Uh, I talk to conservatives because I'm interested in conservatives. I did not grow up with any of conservatism in my life, so it kind of fascinates me. Uh, and I glean mad persuasion advice from people with rhetorical or rhetorical-esque experience and backgrounds. Professional, professional persuaders, rhetoricians, writers, message, message adapters. Uh, which brings us to my uh, guy, my uh, second, my second time with my guest today. Again, multi-talent. Mike Long, he teaches at Georgetown. Georgetown, right? Georgetown University. Yeah. Georgetown University. Has a big history writing speeches, books, ghost writing. You've read stuff or heard stuff that this guy has shaped. I promise at some point in your life, it's seeped in. And you have no idea he exists, but I do. He's right there. He's right there on my screen. Where's my finger? Right, right there, somewhere there. Uh, and we're going to talk to him today, and he's going to give us... He's going to give us Mike wisdom, aren't you, Mike? I'm all about the wisdom. I'm all about the wisdom. No treble. It's hisdom. Like it's it's male centric. It's uh, we are constantly male splaining. So it's hisdom. <laughs> so now, so now that now that it's just the guys listening at this point. <laughs> okay, let's talk well, about football. You know, I've tried on this podcast. It's mostly male. It's mostly white males. I think like 40 of the interviews have been middle-aged white guys. Um, Cause that's, I guess, basically who I've made friends with and who will answer my request for, Hey, you're, you that, or you're, a bigot. I, I, you're that or you're a bigot. I don't understand. It could be one or the it other. It could be one or the other, right? It These things are all on the yeah. table. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm an, un, an unknown bigot. You have false consciousness. It's in me. <laughs> so, but let's um, let's dive right in. We've got all sorts of things we can talk about. Uh, last time, I think we talked a bit about the uh, the academy and working at universities and teaching writing and all that good stuff. And you're doing a lot of ghost writing right now, right? That's right. Uh, it, it's funny. It, it's funny. I'm going to jump in here, and you just you just say, "Okay, okay Mike, calm down." At any point, Dan, is uh, I remember back in I guess it was. As, as this whole pandemic thing was getting underway, maybe February or March, maybe that late. And I'm sitting across from a, a friend of mine, Jonathan Rick, who does a lot of the things I do. We, we, we do, we have similar curves. And, uh, and we didn't know if this, uh, this, the, if there, we didn't know the lockdowns were coming. And I said, well, I think this is gonna, this is gonna be something big on us. I don't know what it is, but I said, we make our living traveling and, uh, and giving lectures. And I said, I think this may shut us down for a couple of months, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And he said, oh, I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe. Well, of course, we all know how that came out. And, and so the pandemic shifted a lot of my work from because it shifted a lot of it to ghosting, as you said, a lot of it to writing books. And uh, it also surprised me in that people didn't just say, well, let's continue the training. Let's just do it online. A lot of my work went away in that area for a long, it's coming back, it's coming back. But, but I was surprised that I really shifted my attention to, can you write this for me at length? And uh, it's, it's been a fun switch and it's, it's been significant. It's interesting. One of the chapters in my book, 21 Coliseums of Persuasion is about professionalization of your persuasion that so many people when they go into persuasion situations are bringing amateur structures they don't have teams they don't have money they don't have time to research they don't do any of that stuff they just jump right in and then they wonder why they fail when they try to persuade a difficult target especially 
And so you've come from, we've both done this a lot. I came more from the academic side and then I moved later into professional writing outside of comedy, but you've done a big history in pro the professionalization of messaging. And I've never heard it put that way, but that's, that's very accurate. Actually. People don't see it. All they see is the message and they think, oh, that's what messages are. And there's this massive gap between natural messaging and professionalized messaging. Yes. And I try to point that gap out to people, but they literally, I don't think they can even see it. It reminds me of that uh, Robin Williams bit about how you think your baby's smart and the baby points at you and goes, mommy. And then the baby points at a chair and goes, mommy. That's what I think you're talking about is if you get it right the first time, you think, well, I know all there is to know. And then you totally blow it the next time. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, unless you, un you can feel your way through it a long way without being too lucky. But unless you understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you're making these choices, ultimately you're gonna fail. Now, how much do you intellectualize this versus the sort of talent creative side? I think you, you're like me, that you intellectualize your process and the whole, again, professionalization of messaging. And that's one of the reasons why you're, I'm sure you're a good teacher and why you can you know, talk about this stuff. Some people are more, and a lot of the writers I work with in Hollywood, never really intellectualize what they do. They just do it and they do it at a high level, but they don't have an architecture or a vocabulary to explain what they're doing. I heard a, a term that I hadn't heard myself uh, ever. And they, the, the writer called it pantsing it, seat of the pants, pantsing it. And that's, that's a term I've used a lot. And, and I know those kinds of people you're talking about and they're, they're formidable, but they're, I always feel like they're working without a net in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, the best thing that ever happened to me was 2007, a, a, a friend of mine who was already teaching in the professional program at Georgetown asked me if I would like to teach a course there. And I, I said, sure, why not? Just it was an opportunity to make a few thousand dollars for a few nights uh, over, over a semester. And I thought, you know what? I have not done exactly what you just said, Dan, which is I had not intellectualized my process, which had been pretty successful so far. And that was the beginning of my formal intellectualizing or professionalization, I guess is another way to think of it, of what I do. And I'm so fortunate that I was trained as a physicist and that I wrote code for a decade after that, because I was just naturally accustomed to looking at a problem and breaking it into pieces and right. saying, oh, and this is the, because that's what coding is, is examine a process and create a step-by-step -step method to achieve the outcome. And that's all I did with first public relations documents, and then in a larger sense, thinking about speeches and so forth. And, and it's become my, 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 uh, my modus the, for the, the rest of the time. Don't you think that's a super advantage, really? That's one of the reasons why I dedicate an entire coliseum to professionalization, because I see this a lot in normal argument. I, I have this kind of tripart schema that I use for a lot of things, where over here is kind of the natural world, like how the informal world of how everybody does it. And then over here is the super formalized, professional, intellectualized world. And then there's that mixy space in between where you get, you know, where most people live. Yeah. But when I hear people try to do argument in the regular spaces, like either over here with <clears throat> no training or the mixy spaces, they do it so poorly that I'm like, why even engage if you don't understand the things that keep arguments moving well so that they don't bog down and they don't lead you to bad conclusions. But the, the, the world does not want you to slow it down and say, hey, let me show you how to argue before you get in there. <laughs> it's just so much easier when you know why you're doing what you're doing. And here's an example. Um, I, I love when I teach creative writing, or better yet, when somebody just comes up and says, I'm right, trying to write a story, can you give me some help? Or I can't get this character off. Anyway, what I'm leading to is this. I tell them, give your character a physical characteristic that you think doesn't matter at all. Say that they have uh, a, a, a patch over one eye. Say that they have a terrible limp. Say like Dr. House, remember he had the pain on the house, the house shop? Pain is like, give them a, a, a terrible scar, just pick something 
because that's going to launch all sorts of emotional and intellectual reactions for that person to accommodate it, other person to do it. And that's your, that's your jumping off point. You tell people, write a character by give, making them utterly ordinary, except for one thing. And that idea can lead to an entire story. But if you don't know that, you're just going to say, well, I want to make my character special. I know he'll have a superpower. Oh, just shoot me now. Come on. That's not how it works. And I know what you want to write, which is not a superhero story. You want to write a thinly veiled version of your own internal troubles. So <laughs> doesn't everybody, well, it's this level between, and what you just did, you know, shows me like when you get a, a really good intellectualized person who's had time to think about it, who's had a reason to think about it because they have to teach it to other people, you get very specific tactic recommendations yes. versus strategies. And I see this all the time when I used to be a panelist down at the Austin Film Festival. They had this cool little thing that they did called round tables where you would come in and there'd be 12, like 10 or 12 uh, convention people sitting there at a table and there may be seven or eight professionals from the industry of whatever they were doing would come in and you'd sit for 15 minutes at a table and then rotate to a new table and you would do four of those in an hour. So you would sit down 10 or 12 new people, you know, who are trying to break into the business or had screenplays or whatever, and they could ask you anything. Mm -hmm. And so I would always sit down and be like, okay, uh, I have lots of connections in Hollywood. I like to produce things. I produce comedy. What do you got? Pitch me silence. Like it was just silence. I'm like, see, none of you know how to pitch because you've never been taught how to pitch. And yet you want to get in and make a living where pitching is kind of the thing that's going to get you paid. Yeah. So let me show you how to pitch. Yeah. And just that, the fact that they, they were all had paid a thousand, twelve hundred dollars to travel across the world. Sometimes there are people coming in from Australia to Austin, Texas for this conference. And they didn't have the training to do what the thing that they, they wanted to do. And it drove me crazy because I oh. wanted to give them that training. It, 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 it breaks your heart because the thing, the thing they needed to hear would take 10 seconds to say, which is, if you're going to be somewhere, show up with a pitch. That's number one. Even if it's a shitty pitch, show up with something, you know, Sh yeah. shitty pitches sell all the time, but I you mean, have to have something. You're trying to sell stories. If you yeah. can't tell me your story in 20 seconds, get out of here because right. you have not learned. It's like a sales salesperson who doesn't have a product. I'm just knocking on doors. Yeah. And they're like, what are you selling? I don't know. <laughs> well, this is this is this is how professionalization doesn't have to be terrifying. And I think people hear, oh, already these two are talking about intellectualizing it. And I don't want any part of that. No, no. If I give you, like, if you just do what Dan just said about show up at the pitch, or you do what I just said, which is give a character some random characteristic, you can build a whole career on just those two ideas right there. You, just because we talk about intellectualizing stuff doesn't mean we approach everything like, you know, like a space alien. I don't approach anything like a space alien. I just pick something and I move forward down that path based on the all you have to do is is pick up these little these little tips and act on them yeah it definitely makes you uh it makes you functional you know yeah. if you have a bag of 10 very specific things you do and you just do those over and over again you can probably work in a lot of professions oh yeah and i'm curious like what you're what where are you from like what is your background i'm hardcore working class first person my family to go to college so I came from a community that did not have a lot of education, had a mm -hmm. lot of smart people, had a lot of talented and skilled people at their occupation and things like that. But there wasn't a lot of formal education in that community. And I always really enjoyed formal education because it just upped the game on what was available to me. So I read tons of books and I went through all the way to a PhD just because I like, I value information access. Mm -hmm. And so when I teach stuff, I take it back down, like, like we're doing here, where I may know a lot about story or about pitching or selling in Hollywood, but let's go back to the basics. Let me show you how to just do a pitch because I know that that's where they're starting from. And so my working class background, I think always brings me back to, Hey, give them something super functional right now that they can be actionable. You can go back and do the full intellectualism later if they want that. But most people, they just want that bottom 
third of, Hey, here's some great advice. That's just actionable right now. What's your background? Like, cause you seem to understand that same lesson. Um, I, I think I've thought about my problems a lot. Uh, <laughs> I, I came from a rural background. My father was a pastor, country preacher, and he was a very that's good right. one. Yeah. I, I don't think that's just my bias. I think he really was very good at it. And, um, he was a good writer. Uh, you know, I, and he was a pantser, you know, like I said before, he was pantsing it. I, I don't think he was intellectualizing a lot. I mean, he had some education about that, like all but the last semester of his degree. And then he came back and got it years later. I think my approach stems from a, 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 a profound character trait that sometimes presents itself as mental illness. Uh, in me, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, I, but I mean, in all seriousness, yeah, it's been a, it's been a mental illness for me is that um, as I've been really insecure as a little kid, uh, a lot of anxiety and the way that I, I found a way through that was to try to be the smartest person in the room. And That's that of course is a, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a losing proposition in most cases. Cause yeah, but always it's armor. Somewhere. It's definitely armor. Exactly. For sure. And so I've thought nobody, nobody can hurt me if I can be nice enough to them that they don't want to hurt me and that I can <laughs> give them understanding of whatever's going on. So I've tried to be, and especially the past few years, I've really tried to, I, I use this word joy a lot, which I hate because I know it sounds so new agey, but, but if I can, if I can, if I can surround myself with things that bring me joy and I can share that joy with other people, then I think I'm doing something good. Um, so for me, my method is I want people to understand. I love the, I love to look at people and see that they get it. I love how happy they get when they understand something so easily and quickly. I love how it makes me feel, it makes me feel strong and even superior. I like that. And I like, I like spending time in my head. I had to work really hard to get everything calmed down in here to be able to work consistently. And I mean, not that I couldn't work. I mean, I've, I've never been crippled by that. But you know what I mean? There's a sure. lot of chase, a lot of bunnies up there. And <laughs> now I, I like the way my mind is furnished. I adore the way I get to spend my days. And that has made people want to be around me and want to purchase the things I offer. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's. No, that's great. That's a, I think understanding what, what you come from when you go forth to construct messaging or what you come from when you go forth to share politics or do persuasion or any of that stuff is super important. So many people don't. I see a lot of people who will hold on to a belief system with no understanding about why they hold on to that belief system. Well, I'm, I'm working on a, a piece right now, and I, I don't know if I'll finish it, but it's a, it's a, it's a piece about political activism as a kind of replacement that rushes in where religious fervor used to be. And um, I'm thinking in particular about, now this really sounds long here, but I'm thinking about parallels between the current situation and the prohibition era, because prohibition was a progressive movement artifact. Uh, and it was, a, it was a, a kind of moral hygiene that had to do with incomes for, that maintaining incomes for working class people. Uh, and it was a, it was a kind of a um, noblesse oblige thing. Uh, and, I, and I see big parallels between what's happening now and what happened then. And so anyway, I, I, I think this, this idea you talk about, about, about fervor, about, about belief, about emotion, we, we choose what we're going to believe in, and then we back and fill with the facts to justify it. And that's probably the best thing I know about persuasion is quit trying to argue persuasion and make people feel it. Like, I, I, I love this. A guy, I never forget, he told me this. He said, when you're arguing issues with somebody and they say, we can't afford this, and we don't have the funding for that, and we don't have the manpower for that, and we can't do the programming. He said, you can stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, all that may be true, but look at this starving child. And I've never forgotten that. Everything flows from emotion. You're going to do what you're going to do. And then you're going to justify it later. Well, prohibition is a great example I, for when you want to really understand what happens with American politics. I mean, going back into the, the teetotaler movement and, you know, all this energy and all the forces that came together around that one product, you know, of alcohol mm -hmm. because of like you said, like it interrupted work for families. It destroyed life for women 
Yes, that was the thing. It was part of the women's rise of women at the start of the 20th century. Yeah. So what else do you know about that? Because I've studied that some and I find it really fascinating. Like some of the characters, you know, that came out of there that people, they don't kind of remember, but like Susan B. Anthony started as a teetotaler prohibition. Yes. Uh, you know, it morphed over also, of course, into, you know, uh, women's women's rights. But like, uh, what was her name with the hatchet? Um, oh, uh, if you had Molly that. Hatchet. <laughs> it was Molly Hatchet, yes. She, she was, was the original Molly disaster. Hatchet. Disaster, yeah, that's it. But she would literally take a hatchet. That was her whole thing. What a great piece of rhetoric this was to go and go into saloons and taverns and just smash all their shit. Yeah, yeah. I, I think prohibition is a, is a is a useful uh, is a, is a useful lesson. I mean, you can draw so much from that. I, I'm not an expert on it by any stretch. I, I think what I think what distorts our our view now is that when I grew up, especially growing up in an, in an evangelical, almost fundamentalist home, uh, and I mean those terms differently, by the way, um, the the idea of politics and moral hygiene was a right wing idea that came up in the 70s. But politics as moral hygiene was, in fact, more historically a progressive idea. And so uh, we are an anomaly in history, I think, the way we think about it, or at least the way I think about it, I'm trying to adjust that. Well, it's so odd, this idea of progressivism versus traditionalism, because it does, it oscillates differently at different times and around different issues. So the idea of banning alcohol, banning you know, some type of leisure substance, it's totally against the idea of progressivism and innovation and liberalism right now. It, they're trying it, to get pot. They're trying, you know, yeah. but on the other hand, it's totally makes sense when you look at the damage it was causing to women, to families, to the working class, all that makes sense. So it's, it's perfectly justifiable to attack it from either side of progressivism or traditionalism. Complete, completely. I, I, and, 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 you know, I've told you this off, off camera and I've told you here and I'll say anybody, listen, I, 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 I came to Washington to do politics. I've abandoned politics. I don't much talk about politics. I like talking a bit about you as many disagreements as I know we would have if we sat down as I would have with anybody and you would have with anybody because we're not talking about fuck you. You're wrong. You hate people. I don't think you hate people. You don't think I hate people, but what we're talking about the best way to organize society. And I, I really hate that the notion of progressivism is, is somehow um, distorted as, 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 as something broader than it ought to be, which is progress. Who's opposed to progress? I like progress. Conservatism. Who's opposed to conserving good things? I'm not opposed to that. I think a more accurate conflict is the, 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 the balance between individual liberty, even to do stupid wrong things, versus the power of the state to deny those things for the greater good. That to me is the core difference between them. Because we can look through history and find places where, you know, right now, the right is the home of individual rights. And in the 60s, the left was the home of individual rights. So clearly, it's not about who's for and against individual rights. It's about the encroachment of the private into the public sphere and the public into the private sphere. That's how I see it. Yeah. And when we start diving into this, and I think you're right, like I, I typically can talk to anybody on the right, uh, even though I don't really define myself politically. I, I grew up liberal. I'm a comedian. So I'm going to be for whatever's freest and openest and fun you know, and a lot of, I grew up Catholic and I, I'm not into any kind of the whole thing. You get to feel guilty through it all. I'm not, I, I, I abandoned all of that. Like I, I tell people Jesus had his shot and he blew it. <laughs> like I completely was there like for 16 years until I got out of my family's under my family's Catholic thumb. And I'm like, nah, that nah, didn't really take. <laughs> but so I'm, I'm for whatever's fun, whatever's interesting, whatever's intellectual, whatever comic, and I don't care about the actual politics of it. But the reason why I like talking to the right is because, again, I did not grow up in your background. I grew up in a family that was very hands-off. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that they were super liberal, just my dad didn't care. 
you know, to get involved. He That's was, kind of the best dad to have, I think, Dan. He was involved in his own head. Like, he lived in his own head. He was into his own work, and he was a nice enough person, so he didn't do any damage. But I didn't have that sense of an oppressive or even a heavy presence. Even though we were around religion, it wasn't a heavy religion. You know, it was just, like, working class and, and pretty laid back. and Part of the wallpaper's culture. Yeah. So... So I didn't have that. And so when I run into it and I see like people have come from what I would consider to be more hardened backgrounds, like a hardened institution or a hardened community that's very strong in what it expects. It fascinates me. Sure, sure. Because <laughs> I was never in it. I was completely kind of free to do whatever I wanted. Well, you know, the guy that changed me, uh, and you know, I, this will be fun, is Bill Hicks. Uh, oh my god that's a just stop with that because that's a great inheritance like if you can just say that bill hicks changed my life you're doing bill all right hicks, bill hicks <laughs> changed my life i met him once or twice um and that was it it was just very quick at a bar he wasn't drinking at this point um and and his philosophy um as bitter and as mean as his stuff was on the surface underneath he was love he was complete love and you find out that he was with his family and he would go home because he wasn't married. I don't think he was married. He would go home to his mom and dad at Christmas. This, these talks about, oh, Bill hated everybody. Bill was Bill loved his family. He loved his mom and dad. And they were very religious. Like, you remember that joke he used to do about his dad saying, why do you use the F word so much, son? Why do you use the F word when you act? So it's because you've never played the chuckle hut in East fucking Alabama. That's why. <laughs> That's why I use it. Um, I, yeah. Bill Hicks said to me in his work that what matters is you need to be able to say what's on your mind without fear of of reprisals like the bit about hey you said something about jesus i don't like that you said something about christians oh yeah forgive me i mean to me that and that has become the center of my politics is free expression for the individual uber alles. that that's what mattered to me um yeah, and, and Hicks, Hicks, there you go, Hicks. Well, part of the project of the rhetoric warriors thing is to really understand the phenomenon of public discourse, right? To look at it, I start usually with, look at it just as a, uh, it's a stream. It's like a river stream. And we can put whatever we want into that stream. If you start polluting that stream, if that's our mainstream that's coming to everybody that's your drinking water. You know, that's, that's the core of, of one of the things that keeps us alive. If you don't do any type of curation of it, you just let anybody dump anything into there. you you may be in trouble at certain points and people don't really think about the sort of curation of public discourse. It's almost like a national park. You know, it's almost like Yosemite, like you can keep it pure and put the good stuff in there, or you can just let people dump in there and hope they don't dump the bad stuff. So part of the project here is to get people to at least be aware that that public stream is where everybody gets their information. It's where they learn their beliefs and, and sort of, you know, uh, harvest from other smart people and, and systems that they're offered. And we don't really curate it. But like somebody like Hicks, when you add him in there, had this beautiful, artful way of explaining concepts and finding hypocrisies and all those good things you would want in public discourse. But how many people actually know Hicks? How many oh, yeah. people have actually accessed Bill Hicks in this country? Sure, sure. I, nobody knows who he is outside of, if, if you're watching, if you know who Dan is, you like Dan's podcast, you probably know who Hicks is. And if you don't, you, you're welcome. You're I bet you it's 15% or less. Yeah, I, I, I never meet anybody who knows who he is. Never, never. Isn't that insane? It's not surprising, so I don't know if it's insane, but it, it, and he's not for everybody. I mean, he should be like he should literally be. when you think about who you want in that stream, that's just a pure value. I think he's in there. I, I oh, I think he's in there, but I, I, I think that in fact, I, I, I assert this as, as truth is that is that I, I oppose the idea of curation because you have to have a curator sure and nobody who ever's ever had power not i'll do it may not you yeah that's the thing is 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 eventually you're gonna put a thumb on the scale 
And so I would rather trust people with the whole of the stream than to say, well, we better protect them from bad ideas because right. somebody has to say what's bad and good. And we've already seen, I mean, look at yellow journalism, look at modern journalism. You know, if you, if you like, you read a story, you go over to Fox and you read one version, you go to uh, CNN, you read another, you go to MSNBC, you read another. And, and I think all of them, I don't think any of them are, are flat. I think they all have a certain opinion, what they choose to cover. So uh, curation, I think, I think this is where you've got to leave it with the individual. Well, let's talk about that, because that to me is really interesting, because as a professor, as somebody who came through, started, started in ignorance, like I remember when I started into grad school, uh, my first week, I went I basically ended up in grad school because I stopped in a professor's office as an undergrad when I was a senior. And I was like, hey, uh, there's no jobs I want. What do I do next? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this guy. He was young and he was interesting. And he's like, go to grad school. I, I love I love it as sort of the last ditch opportunity. Well, oh, you can do this. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea what grad school was or any of that stuff. So I showed up to grad school at UT Austin and the professor that or the uh, chair of the department, I met with him a week before classes started. And he's like, well, what are you going to take? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, what do you mean you don't know? Nobody comes to grad school and doesn't know what they want to study. I'm like, well, I did. And he's like, I'm like, what do you do? And he said, rhetoric. I'm like, a cool word. What is that? And he laughed again. He made me his TA. And now, you know, 35 years later, I'm still doing rhetoric. But it's this idea that I started with ignorance and I know ignorance. I'm from Kentucky. Like it's a, it's a common, very common feeling. I recognize it and moved up to where I know a lot about rhetoric. I'm probably top 1% in the world just from study of this long. I would be better at curating that stream than just the common people. I don't doubt that that's true, but I don't think you have the right. Why not? Because wouldn't you, you wouldn't you want a clean stream? I do want a clean stream, but your idea of clean may be different from mine. And there are ideas that you may not find value in that I'd like to have access to. And the thought that there's somebody up up at the top of the stream going, yes, yes, no, no, yes, 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 no. I mean, that just flies in the You don't face. trust anybody to be in that position? Not for the whole of the world. I mean, I like like for instance, if I want news, there are places I know I can go to get certain aspects of the news, but I would never want to be cut off from I certainly don't want to be cut off from ideas I disagree with. I certainly want to be cut off from an idea that somebody says, this is dangerous. You better not hear that. Really? Really? You're above me, not you, but, uh, but you're above me. You're going to tell me what's dangerous for me. No, if I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. But <laughs> if, you know, if I, if I, where, where does anybody get off saying, I know what's best for society. Well, let's take this idea because it is it is at it's one of the fundamental issues. I think everybody agrees that individual freedom's wonderful, right? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think that at all. I mean, the government doesn't think it's they're going to ban menthol cigarettes because they don't think black people are smart enough to to stop smoking menthol cigarettes. Well, that's here's what that, I that's think. Condes that's pure condescension. Like again, don't don't worry about the government or the actual practical application of this. Let's just keep it sort of hypothetical at this point. All human beings would say that freedom is a value. All human beings would say freedom is a value. All human beings would say that certain limits on freedom are required in order to get along with other people and to keep yourself safe. Right. So again, go back to my tripart, my intellectual tripart. Over okay. here's perfect freedom. Over here's complete limit. And we live in the center. Yes. You know, right. That's where the fight is. And so I hear a lot of a lot of people with libertarian ideas and sort of the individual freedom ideas. I talk to these people a lot and I'm a, I'm the same way. Like I'm a strong intellectual. I believe in, you know, individuals. I, I hate being told what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, America is this great, this great dichotomy of, you know, don't anybody tell me what to do. And I don't like what those people over there are doing. <laughs> That's, that is the truest thing I've heard in about 24 hours. That's very good. <laughs> so you get these warring forces coming at each other in that sort of middle space. So I, I think it's problematic to say that somebody is qualified to make these decisions for everybody. But I think it's also somebody is way more qualified to make these decisions for everybody than everybody else is. Well, we, we do that with medicine, for instance. I, right. I, don't, 
I don't care what you think about prescriptions, but I care what Dr. Joe down the street thinks about it. I, I believe the danger with ideas is that ideas don't hurt anybody until somebody takes action on them. And so we ought to be able to read and think about anything we want to. And also this stream you talk about exists in a larger stream. We had a society you, you've just described where people sat at the top, not that you advocate this necessarily, but people sat at the top and said, here's a good idea, here's a bad idea. What did that bring us? Well, it brought us black people who couldn't, who couldn't uh, walk around in public without being afraid of, of going in the wrong door. It brought us women who, who uh, were suppressed from leaving the home and getting a job. Uh, up until 1871, uh, under the common law, this is all of history, you could beat your wife as a husband because it was an understood element of what they called the lower classes at the time. So when you have somebody sitting at the top, these things evolve. And so to suddenly say, well, we're at the top of the heap now, we know what's best. We're no different. Enough. What are they going to say about you in 200 years? Which I grant you, doesn't, doesn't, uh, 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 excuse us from having to live in a practical and safe way today. But that's my concern. Uh, who will watch the watchers? Yeah. And it's a super, it's a super valid concern, right? Nobody would ever say you have carte blanche to decide what I do in life. And I don't want anybody checking on you. <laughs> right. Well, you know, Hicks, Hicks used to do a thing about drugs. He said, you can't you can go ahead and ban drugs if you want. He said, you know what people are going to do? They're going to spin around in their yard until they pass out. You can't, you can't foreclose on human choice. And some of those choices are going to be, are going to be bad and bad for them and, and stupid and foolish. Um, and it's interesting because there's only two reasons to care about another person's choice. One, you love them or two, you like telling people what to do. That's it. Okay. So answer, answer me this. So again, I'm, I'm just limiting this to public discourse because that's my area, right? So does, if, if somebody gets really good at presenting and selling and persuading towards something like fascism, should we allow that? Like if they're really, really persuasive, they really have their act together. They're good at getting people along those lines. Should we allow that into the public stream? Well, you've set me up with a Hobson's choice. I either have to agree with you or I have to agree with you. I'm not trying to catch you at all. I, to, I, I'm, I'm not trying to do a got you at all. I'm just No, no, I, well, I, I don't mean that you were, I don't mean that you were trying to say now I screwed Mike over, but I'm saying, I mean, we both know what you're talking about, I think. And uh, well, and, I'm talking about literally like it's with an open public stream, you can sell anything, yes. right? You can put anything in there. And if you're good at it, which everybody is trying to be because they want to be effective, in that public stream, what do we do then? Like when bad things start being sold well? Well, it, I think- good the, line, I'm gonna have to remember that one. That is, you should write that down, well. put it on the list. I think the <laughs> trouble there is, is you're using the word fascism as sort of a loaded catch-all term uh, about for just general badness. You know, if somebody is saying, if somebody is saying, uh, I don't know, you, you have to be specific about it. Um, if we're talking about somebody who says bad things about, Somebody says homosexuality is, is a moral wrong. Somebody says that. Should we ban them from saying that? Well, no, no. If somebody says uh, uh, we, we, that, that doesn't make them right, but we have to allow people to say what they have to say, uh, even, if it's, uh, if, even if it seems to us to be a terrible idea. Because a hundred years ago, if somebody had said, you know, uh, homosexuality is an evil, and it will damage the family. The people in charge of the stream said, you're exactly right. That's the message to go. And somebody says, you know what? We ought to rethink our attitude toward people just because they do something in private. And we go, how dare you? And they would be foreclosed. So I'm always going to come back to that, is that fascism is a, whatever you're going to talk about, whatever, you can always find some bad thing that we can go, well, that's bad. And then use that as the, kick the door open for everything. We either allow everything or nothing. Now, see, there's there's the question. Like, it, it's it's 100 open, or it's 80 percent open. How are you going to? Everyone wants it? to give me those either ors. Like, it's either somebody's closing it down, or it's completely open. So, like, my thing on on homosexuality is, I think everybody uh, should be required to be in a homosexual marriage. Like, before you can, <laughs> before you can do a regular marriage, you have to have a gay marriage. At I, least I think, a year, I think so you really 
Yeah, so you really understand the issue. I think that's a good idea. I like it. I've, I've, I've called for this for years. I've worked for Canada to advocate your idea. So, uh, <laughs> so that's it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it comes back to individualism. Right, yeah, there are shitty you, ideas out there and I avoid 20, them. 20% of your individualism to have a cleaner stream? No, I don't, I don't want a cleaner stream because I don't want somebody telling me what clean is because I've seen what somebody's idea of clean was 20 years ago. You don't trust me? Ago. Come on, I, I said I would do it. I, I wouldn't trust you to lead me across the street, Dan. You no. certainly would. You would trust me. I know you well, would. The, 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 best, the best government, the most effective, efficient, and moral government would be a dictator who made perfect choices. Since we can't have that, we have to do something else. There is never going to be some eschaton. Uh, we, we need to accept that there are rough edges and damage and death as part of life. Um, and I, I don't see a way around it. Well, as a rhetorician, and again, as somebody who thinks a lot about what we need to do with the public stream right now, I think the ham-handed things, the clunky, you know, restrictions and forbidding you and, sh and silencing you and all that kind of stuff. I don't think those really in America ever work very well. I think almost everybody, again, in America, if you are within the American spirit and the American approach to things is against banning. It's against, you know, that sort of super restriction, that kind of stuff. But like to at least be able to label, and I do this in the, uh, the, literally the logo and the slogan for rhetoric warriors is ethical only persuasion. Like I'm trying to teach people to recognize what is ethical persuasion versus unethical persuasion. And again, it's this tripart, here's unethical, here's ethical, and here's the slipperiness in the middle. Cause those terms break down, you know, when you start to look at them, but I see so much unethical persuasion right now in our public stream. And the question is, what do you do about it? The idea of let's just leave it alone, laissez-faire, individualism, the free market, it'll work itself out. That's, that's a little bit of a slippery slope. It's a little bit of a fallacy to say that will clean itself up and everybody will, will be it fine. It won't, it won't clean itself up. It won't clean itself up. I mean, the thing, you're, the thing you're, you're diminishing is the power of persuasion itself. If these ideas are so bad, then engage in this persuasion you, you, you hold so in such high esteem and persuade them that it's bad. Um, and as for ethicism, uh, the, the, we, we can all learn something from the libertarians. The foundational idea of libertarianism is that government exists as a coercive force. Uh, right. What was it Mao said? Change must come from the barrel of a gun. Read, uh, what is it, Harrison, not Harrison Bergeron. What is it? Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener, I prefer not to. And, the, like, and this is the example I've used with, with kids and with, with anybody who wants to hear it. And they say, well, the government doesn't just go shoot people. They don't just go drag you away for anything. I said, yeah, they do. I said, let's say you get 20 parking tickets and they come, they send you a thing, pay the tickets. You go, no, I'm not going to do that. So they come to your house and they say, you need to pay these. I'm not going to do that. We need you to come out. We're going to take you to jail. I'm not going to do that. What do they do next? They get a gun over parking every power that the government has flows from the barrel of a gun. It doesn't come to that very often because we have so much in common. We all want the good things you just talked about. I want them. You want them. We disagree only about the best way to get there. That's all you and I disagree about. What is, what is that final state and how do we get there? Otherwise, we're like, we're like this. We're like this. So uh, as for ethical, the only ethical choice I ever see is persuasion, which is where you excel. I think that a world that I've just described would in fact be far more appealing to you than the world you described for yourself, except that perhaps maybe you want that smooth world more than you want to engage in persuasion, but I don't know. And I say that with all kindness, by the way, I'm not setting you up either. No, sure. Um, I'm just trying to be realistic about how do I get that stream to be clean so that people are accessing good information and they can make good decisions. But it can't be clean. It's it's there. You you learn real quick. If Look ever this I way. To you you tell me there's aliens. I know I'm not going to listen to you much longer. If somebody says something stupid, I, I quit listening to them. Right. But look at it this way. Say you're teaching your college class, right? You're a dictator in there. You're the you're the, you create the stream. Yes. Other shit doesn't get into the stream. Maybe a yes. little bit of the students here and there. Yes. What if you had five other people every time 
you know, you talk for a minute, they jumped in and just ripped apart what you said or said something completely opposite. You'd never get anything done. The problem with the parallel is the people in my class chose to be there and I let them in. And if they don't want to be there and I start saying bullshit, they can leave any time. They can go back to the public stream, sort through all that horse shit that's out there until they find another guy who's smarter than Mike, which shouldn't be hard to find, by the way. <laughs> and you find that guy, you reel him in, and you go sit in his class. All right. Well, what we're going to do is I'm, we're going to switch to comedy because I want to talk about the Green Acres thing. All right. But I want you to think about it for me because it's fascinating, again, for me to hear from your perspective, because uh, you've worked a lot on the right. And you, like you said, you came from a background like that, yeah. that when you look at something like like I'm just localizing it to public discourse. Like the difference if we had, and this may be a hypothetical we can never get to, if we had a really super clean, well curated, well uh, managed, not even, I don't even know how we get there, but say Bill Hicks is taught in every goddamn co you know, classroom in the country. Because have, that guy had a clarity. I'll write money, I'll donate. He had a clarity of vision that everybody should hear. And I could list a hundred people like that, that I would love to have access to our, our kids all the way through education because they're such crystalline observers of the human condition. Yes. And they never get into the system and it drives yes. me crazy. Yes. So I want you to think about that because I think you and I would both agree that someone like Hicks would be super valuable to have in the public stream. I, I think he would be awesome. I'm, I'm so sorry he's gone. I'm sorry Carlin is gone. Um, uh, I, 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 I wonder what they would say. I really am prior, not so much, but I don't know a lot about prior, but Carlin, I really, really wonder what he'd say. Yeah. Fascinating that those guys, like our best minds, sometimes I think never get into the big public discourse. This is, I love talking to you in the short time that we've done this a couple of times and we've, we've been acquainted with each other for years, but I, I don't talk about this stuff with anybody but I like talking to you. I don't know what it is. I do know what it is, but I, I got to tell you, I, I like, I like talking to you about it because I don't meet anybody who's willing to say, well, let's just go down this path instead of how can I make this other guy look like a prick? This is good. <laughs> yeah. It's again, like that, that's, that to me is just useless uh, dialectics. Like no, I, I like see people doing it all the time. I'm like, why just, you know, bull versus bear. What's the use? Like yeah. find me something useful that I can learn from these people or that the dialogue will teach other people. And then I'm in, but otherwise, oh. so let's dive over into some comedy. What about green acres, man? Green acres. One of the, one of the, the, the overlook pieces. I always hate that underrated kind of crap. People talk about, Oh, it's underrated. No, it's just, it's just forgotten. And explain the it to people a little bit. Cause I bet you a lot of people don't even remember what it is. Well, green acres was part of the, I, I, it's it's there's a thing called rural comedy block that CBS had in the late sixties and early seventies. I guess it didn't make it to the seventies, did it? Um, of Beverly Hillbillies, Petticoat Junction, and Green Acres. I don't think there was anything else, at least nothing that lasted. Hee Haw was around there somewhere. Hee Haw was a, yeah, it was a syndicated thing, I think, after CBS dumped it. Anyway, um, anybody correct me, feel free. I'm not a TV scholar. Andy not Griffith. Andy Griffith. There you go. Andy Griffith and then Mayberry RFD after after uh, after Griffith left. Um, Green Acres was an absurdist sitcom about a New York attorney uh, of of archetypal style uh, and a uh, uh, with a, a man with a glamorous wife of foreign extraction who had a a, a, a weird accent and and a, and a kind of a silly way about her. And he gave Zsa up. Zsa Gabor. No, it was what Ava Gabor, name. actually. It was Ava Gabor, actually. Oh, was it? Sister. It was Ava, yes. Huh. And they, they moved to a city in an unnamed state. It appears to be upstate New York, but it's not, not clear. Um, a town called Hooterville. And he becomes a farmer. He knows nothing about it. He's terrible at it. And he is, the, he is our representative there. He is the sane man. It's a standard trope in, in comedy and sitcoms. Sane man in an insane world. And that's the whole thing. Uh, and that from this, they said, instead of, instead of just playing one angle or the other, there are a lot of ways to go. They just said, how far can we turn the dial on absolute absurdity? Can we play with reality? Can we play with time? What can we do? It's a, it's a bizarre, funny thing. The only thing that ages it is 
the MTV cuts that were born in the eighties that caused us to need something really quickly. It's yeah, not the scenes are like, long. Yeah. They, they get yeah. multiple dialogues back and forth. It's not just snappy joke and then out, but yeah. yeah. Stuff I, that you know, you're right. Yeah. You, the stuff you know how to write. You're a pro at that. You could, you could cut a green acre script down to 10 minutes. I'll bet. Well, yeah. I mean, you get to the point where you, you learn Hollywood now is just stimulation. There's no time in between stimulation. It's punch, 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 punch. But like I grew up, we talked about this before we got started. I grew up in Kentucky and it wasn't rural. It was suburban. I was right on the edge of rural and city. So we had those little, you know, new development communities that had grown up right there on the edge of Louisville. But my whole family from both sides like one generation back was tobacco farmers. My grandparents uh, in Indiana, you know, backwards Indiana, we'd go and stay with them. And so I, I was a rat rule was around me all over the place, but I was being pulled into the city. That was sort of the hotel of my, the siblings, me, my sister, my brothers, um, that we had the option of moving away from the rural and getting pulled into the urban, you know, and that mm -hmm. sort of education and, and all the things that are there. So those, those sitcoms, I was so un undrawn to those sitcoms. I can't even tell you. Beverly Hillbillies, I'm like, I don't need to see idiots. It doesn't <laughs> interest me. <laughs> and Green Acres was kind of that way, like the barber, Floyd the barber, was that his name? That was, that was from uh, Andy Griffith. Oh, that was Andy Griffith. Yeah. But there was a, you know, anytime somebody would show up in overalls, I'm like, I'm out, I'm out. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the different Beverly Hillbillies was a different trope. Um, and that was the wise, the wise fool. The, the Beverly Hillbillies were the uneducated backwoods people who were wiser than all right. the educated city folks. So it was a different trope um, and, a diff and a much different approach. Green Acres lived on a different planet. Green Acres was about, um, but first they built a lot of, there was a series of set pieces. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a plot so much as, an excuse to do old vaudeville routines. Yeah, and for Eddie Albert to do his take. Yeah, and to do his, his low, slow burn, his take. What the, of all the stupid he had, you know, <laughs> that he would say. And they would, they would bring in characters who behaved in absurd ways and seemed to have, I like the thing that, I, that we were talking about earlier, is one of the characters, a minor character, was Arnold the Pig. It was a pig who was treated like the offspring of a couple named Ziffel. <laughs> and Arnold did nothing but snort like a pig, yet everyone understood it as English and conversed with him. Um, he became, he was an heir. He went to Hollywood because he wanted to be in a movie and he became a movie star. He became a TV weatherman because the way his tail curled told us what the weather would be. Nice. Um, and then he was treated like a human being, like Brian, uh, in an unremarkable way, like Brian on Family Guy. Only Brian can talk. And and this was just some common thing. It was just like, oh, if, if you're if you're fan, if you're electric fan talk. And that was just part of it. Okay. And that was so very it, nice. It had, it had those elements, like you said, of absurdity, surrealism, but yes. it never it never pointed at them. It acted like those were just sort of within the realism, you know, that, space. You just you hit the key right there. They never remarked on any of it. Just like if a, if, a, if, a, if a balloon blew out of my ear, you would never even say it. It was like, well, that's what happens. You might as well, well be breathing. Of course, that's what happens. Yeah. Of course, that pig talks. Of course, that horse talks. Mr. Ebb was another one that was, you know, rural. And There you go. Well, you know, when, when on Green Acres, when these crazy things would happen, Mr. Douglas, not Mr. Yeah, Mr. Douglas, the... the, uh, the that's the, the guy I was trying to think of. There you go. Eddie Albert, he would remark on them occasionally, and people would look at him like he'd grown a second head. <laughs> like, why are you it was like, it's like, if I said to you, you're breathing, Dan, you go, uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, and this show, this show, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm out of words for it. I don't know what else there is to say, except I, there's never been anything approaching it in terms of absurdity. Um, you got elements of it on community, but that was still far more intellectualized than just the gut punch ridiculousness of Green Acres. It's fascinating you know, everybody looks for political insight everywhere. And one of the traditions in rhetorical criticism is to take any type of public artifact like that, like Green Acres, like I'm sure somebody has written a dissertation in rhetoric on Green Acres, I like hope so. pulling out the rural versus the urban, you know, the fact that the culture was transitioning then, and trying to get a sense now, like when you apply those lessons upwards, sort of, you, know, you look at the political map, and you see, 70% of the country is red, 
you know, geographically, right, but, but then would... populationally, you know, blue j just jumps up above it. And you're like, how is, how is Montana having this much effect on our politics? Well, you look at the history of that stuff with the power of the rule is still there. You know, the farm is still there as a power center in, in America, but we just don't talk about it as much. It yeah. seems foreign to all the people in the cities that farms even still exist. Well, it's this is this is part of the problem of, uh, and, and one of the great ironies uh, is is of, of this of this sought after homogeneity at the federal level, uh, from a from a federalist standpoint or an anti federal. Well, the, the meanings flipped, so let's just set those aside and say, if you favor local control of government local control over federal control, then people on the left won't have any problem in these blue areas because they control them. Uh, I don't know why they focus so much on, well, I have some theories, but why they focus so much on federal control when they can do anything they want in the places they completely and utterly control. The cities are blue, period, full stop. They could do anything they want. The left runs runs the, uh, runs the cities. So why in the fuck do they care what happens in Montana? They don't live in Montana. <laughs> It is interesting, and I think that's one of the things I watched with uh, the Trump presidency, him going after the cities, like coming into direct conflict with the cities. And yeah, I don't think that had really been done before, where he took them on. Well, it's it was it was it was uh, I think it was uh, what do you call fan service? You know, he was he was appealing to people on the right and who had felt like enough is enough. I want you to stick it to them because they <laughs> stick it to us all the time. And so the cities, as I just said, they're they're blue axiomatically. They're going to be blue. So if you just take on the cities, it's code for saying those rotten Democrats. Look at you. I, I think that's all it was. It's fascinating, though, that when you look at politics just from a narrative and sort of, again, not not from a content or ideological perspective at all, but just this is kind of the combatant thing that I do with the 21 Coliseums, that if you just look at it as a form of combat, we're divor divorce it from religion, from content, from anything. It's just this is how people are going to fight in public. And so the fact that there is the cities have a power you know, source. They are a source of power of a certain type of politics, but the rural is sitting out there, un, you know, underrepresented or under coalesced. And then Trump comes in and is like, oh, there's power over here. I'm going to now crush that up against the cities. <laughs> like, oh, there you go. I, I see why you would take that tack. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. As a rhetorical tack, it, it, it makes sense. You know, everybody, everybody has their thoughts about Trump and they're mostly negative. But nobody's played, nobody's played his hand as well uh, or as successfully as, as that guy did, unless you count losing, which, which is not much of a victory. But well, the genius, the genius of Trump is that he had a beacon, a radar for conflict like nobody else. The guy can find a conflict and knows how to pull it up into the ring and like, here we go. Like anytime anybody says anything against him or even close, different from the way he looks at things, he's like, great, I got a new fight. Can you if imagine? He actually what laid out all the fights that he had during those four years. I don't, I don't even know you could count them. It's, it's like you said, it's the Hollywood thing. Stimulation, stimulation, stimulation. Yeah. Well, and it's a reality show trope. Like if you learn reality shows, that's, I had a friend who, um, God, I can't remember the name of that thing. It was a boxing reality show where, I remember the name but i think stallone ran it you know was the was the face of it and he went over as a producer and he went over there and they call they don't call him storyist but he was a story producer and it was just who do you put together who has the worst story over here and the best story over here and you'd like to see this guy beat this guy and it's just conflict 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 the, 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 the one piece of advice I give people when they talk about story, I'm teaching story on May 26th, come to my website or go oh, to my cool. Facebook page. You know, I'm teaching storytelling. If I can only tell people one thing about story is you don't have a conflict. You don't have a story. I'm going to the grocery store is not a story. I'm going to the grocery store and I fell in a hole on the way. Now we got something, but no conflict, no story. Yeah. You want a good little uh, clip that'll show that I'll, I'll tell you this. Cause I Please use do. it in classes when I teach narrative. At the beginning of Forrest Gump, he goes to walk across. Uh, he's sitting on the bench over there, right? And somebody goes across, goes to walk across the street, and that feather is floating, you know, starts to float down. And 
um, that Feather almost gets killed about 30 times on the way down yes. to his book. That's a, such a good observation. Yeah. And there's a guy, who, like a, just a random uh, extra who's about to walk across the street, takes one step out and a car almost hits him. Like Zemeckis understands that no matter what's going on, it's only interesting if there's a conflict in it. Even the little side shit that's going on in the story. Yes. The amount of conflict that we see in our narratives right now, again, if you look at the undergirding things that teach people sort of how to talk in public and mm -hmm. how to interact with each other, we're so used to seeing conflict. It's like, no wonder we're in conflict all the time. It's our natural trope. The, you mentioned being on the, which impressed me greatly, by the way, you said you were on a, on a judging panel at Austin Film Festival. You want to see the problem with, with, in my opinion, most indie films is they don't know that. And you see scenes that just lay there. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. It's, it's just, how was your day? Oh, it was tough. I mean, they don't even, we don't even see it in their faces that they've had a bad day. And I, I read, I don't know if it's true. I read that Lauren Michaels used to insist that every show, every scene, every every bit they did on there have a reversal of some kind, even if it's nothing more than he came in and from this side of the stage and left on the other. There had to be that in everything he insisted on and so still does, I guess. There's yeah, got to be. I totally believe that. It's like learning songwriting, you know, yeah. like, you know, oh, yeah. there's got to be a bridge. There's yeah. got to be some emotional transition that sounds yeah. different and gets you to the rest of the song. Yeah, verse if you don't do that, song. then you are not a professional story uh, songwriter. There you go. There you go. And these are the kind of things that if people learn them, it, it's it's like turning on the engine. It's fascinating to me. I would teach that stuff and then they would just resist using it. <laughs> like I would say every mainstream American film has to have a love story. And they would be like, no, I don't have a love story. And I'm like, well, no, you don't have a mainstream American film. And they're like, I, but if you don't have a B story, you don't have a mainstream American. You don't have a film at all. Usually, yeah. that B story's got to got to got to be the upside down of the A, and it's got to solve. That. Now, now I'm using jargon, but the B story. I'm telling you nothing you don't know. The B story has to be the upside down of the A, meaning if the if the leader in the A story is the leader of the whole world in the B story, he's got to be put upon and lost. This resolution of the B story provides the key to solve the A story, and we're out through Act Three. When we were talking earlier about the the little uh, round tables at the Austin Film Festival, I would teach people pitching real quick. And then I would also say, OK, uh, the other thing that I will tell you, if you give me any kind of pitch, if you give me any kind of script or anything else, and if I don't find something interesting about a character on page one, I won't read the rest of it. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, every character in a comedy needs to be twisted into a joke into a humorous character. So like, I'm going to give you guys an example. There's, there's a kid in your script. The script opens with a kid on a bike, delivering newspapers, going down the street. That's the first piece of action. Tell me about that kid. It's going to make him funny. And they're like, uh, I'm like, pick anything. It's kind of like what exactly what you were saying earlier. I'm like, make him blind. He begins everything through the whole run of the series. The first word out of his mouth is always well. Well, well, time. there you go. That's funny. That's funny anyway, by itself right there. He has no arms. He has no arms. Whatever it is. Yeah. He's got to, you know, throw it with his mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything. I'm like, we he can see. He throws with his mouth. There's the title. <laughs> he throws with his mouth. Sundays at 7 on NBC. You know, every location in a story like that, I tell him, is a place to, for you to bore me or interest me. And guess what? If I ever get bored through a whole sentence of yours, you have lost me. That's the difference in a professional. Here, here's my, here's my uh, 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 addition to that. First line has to be killer. Everything you write, I don't care if it's a friggin' letter. First line has to be killer. And I've stuck with this my whole career. I'm working on a novel. The first line is this, and it'll make, I guarantee, I'm just laying it out there. Everybody who's hearing this will want to read this novel based on the sentence I'm about to give you. Charles Manson dreamed of miniature golf. I'm sure. Where could, where could that be going? Clearly. Clearly, you should send that to Tarantino right now as his sequel to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yes, Charles Manson dreamed of, <laughs> of miniature golf, acres and acres of zoysia grass, perfectly cut, no more than an inch. I like it. 
I used to uh, have a card. My card in Hollywood used to be, it said my name, Dan French, and then tiny, tiny font that you couldn't read. People would have to pick, pick up and they'd be like this and they'd look at it and they'd get close and it said, fuck you. <laughs> always got to laugh. They were always like, what the up? Like, you know, yeah. See? When, when David Lynch won at, at Con, his, his bio was one line, Eagle Scout, 1967. Right? You got to yeah. do something with it, you know. <laughs> So that idea, that pleasure that you get of just twist, 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 twist. That's the only real pleasure you get in that kind of writing. And I just love it when I see it done well. So, well, again, super fun, man, as always. Always, always fun, man. This is great. And uh, I appreciate you wandering down political paths and intellectual paths. And there's good advice in here. So this is a, this is a solid episode. Well, you got me to turn off my paranoia. So that's pretty good. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need to turn that off for the whole the whole country. It'd be nice if, if it were safe to do so. I would love it. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, pitch your stuff, man. Pitch your course, whatever you got. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, when's this going to run? Gonna, we're going to be... I'll uh, probably do it next week. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be teaching storytelling uh, May 26th. It's about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, if you'll visit me on Facebook, Mike Long, uh, you can see, uh, you can poke through there. Um, visit me at MikeLongOnline.com. Visit me at the Ma or ProMagicShow.com for uh, writing tips. Um, and follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn. There's some nonsense going on over there. You'll have fun. <laughs> visit, follow, stalk, find. Mike Long is out there and he's he's got stuff to tell you. So So do that. Buy the molecule of more available wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> well, cool, man. We'll circle back around at some point in the future. Uh, again, I appreciate it very much. Uh, everybody, this is Mike Long on the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Get out there and do some persuasion because otherwise somebody's going to come in and curate your stream. You don't want that. <laughs> I don't want that. No, no, no. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye.